Welcome back, everyone, to the 0K April 2020 1v1 tournament. We are in the final round of the Swiss portion of this tournament, and it is going to be starting with Randy and Daimfreund going at it. If Randy wins this, they are solidly in first place. If Daimfreund wins this, then we are looking at a three-way tie for first place. Because look at the brackets. We also have our second place match, or, well, I guess our other match, which is Kshatriya Manor 12, and that is... Whoever wins that is going to be in a tie-break situation for at least third, well, at least second. Like, they're going to be fighting whoever loses this in a tie-break situation. But, because whoever wins this goes 5-1, whoever wins that goes 5-1. If Randy loses, then they'd also be 5-1 if Dime Floyd wins. If Randy wins, then they're 6-0, one of Kshatriya Mana 12 is 5-1. And then Dimefriend and the other one are 4-2 each. And then there's a tiebreak for third place. So we either get a three-way tie for first place, or we just get a single tiebreak match for third place. Depending on whether or not Dimefriend wins. So we are on Banana Republic. My goodness, this is so much smoother. Thank you, Google Frog, for this terrain upgrade. Anyway. Let's get started. Ah, that bubbling lava. God love lava. It's such a swimmable liquid. I mean, once, briefly. Actually, no, it isn't. It's very dense. You wouldn't swim. You'd just burst into flames and skip across the surface as the gases in your body boil and start to cause you to kind of inflate like a balloon and then you'd bounce around. That was a unpleasant image. But yeah, you wouldn't swim. You wouldn't come close to swimming. Actually, maybe maybe a hypermaphic lava. You might be able to. If it's really, really hot, it becomes far less dense. But this... Like, this a lot of it's quite cool. This is clearly felsic lava. You aren't gonna... I know, it sounds weird. It's like, why do you know so much about lava geology? Or at least act like you do. It's like... I did a lot of research for getting lava textures right for... No, lava names right for an Akron map that I made. That was very similar in style to Banana Republic with, like, lava in a forested area. Like, lava with grassy rocks on top. That... Yeah. So I looked up all the stuff about different temperatures of lava and how that works. I did not look up video of people, in la people falling into lava. I do not want to see that. That... I don't know if that videos exist. I don't want to see them if they do. I know someone's going to troll me and, like, slide into my Twitter DMs or something with videos of people burning to death in lava. Please spoiler tag. I don't, I, I don't think saying please don't is going to do anything, so at least spoiler tag. Of course, I forget this. I'm, there's a delay on the stream, so now I'm just getting chat responses to people responding to my weird tangent about lava and how burning works. No, I haven't thrown something in the lava before. What I have, I have, what? Okay, I haven't seen video of someone, some a person being thrown in the lava. I have seen video of garbage of a garbage bag full of garbage being thrown onto lava, and that had roughly the same effect as what I as what apparently would happen to a human body. So, yeah, it wasn't a person, but it was still organic material. Which you'll now have gotten three minutes after I said it initially. Alright, so that was a weird bouncing tangent. Let's get to the game, as Randy's actually doing some damage and building up. Both players are going hovercraft, by the way, in case you hadn't noticed or weren't sure which factory things were because of seeing the units. You may not be familiar with the game, in which case, hello, welcome. This is 0K. It's an RTS game built to, that's about robots fighting each other, where the primary motivation of the game is that you basically don't have any teching. You just build units based on what you can afford, and what you can afford is all a matter of how long it takes to build them. So you can technically afford everything, you just might take minutes to build something and then you lose because your opponent has built a larger army and killed you in the process. So yeah, quick and dirty introduction to Zero K. If you play Total Annihilation, it's based on that. Or played Spring Commander, it's based on the game that Spring Commander is also based on. Just more directly. 
Anyway, Randy, capturing a reasonably large portion of the map, Diamond Throwing is behind 10 metal per second already, and honestly building in a way that I'm a little concerned about. They're starting to get up to the plateau to the south, but not very quickly, and there's a fair bit in the center, especially in the north center, that has not been taken. Diamond Throwing could very easily take this northeast side of the map and has taken none of it, while Randy has taken all the metal extractors in the southwest side of the map symmetrically equivalent, so I don't see how Dime is going to be able to get out of this without massively expanding, building three or four quills, sending them up to the northeast side of the map, and getting all the metal extractors there, because that's 14 metal per second, right there. It's almost 15, really, with point one. And that with that, though, Randy coming in here, getting a bit of harassment in there. Not enough, I'd say, to justify throwing all those daggers into... Nice little metal grinder for Dime Throind. But Randy's 20 metal per second ahead. Dime Throind's winning the attrition war, mind you, but Randy is so far ahead in terms of metal, and they're turning that into a great many quills. They have four quills right in their main base. Not to mention the quills they have outside in the commander as well. On the commander staying in that center north expansion, as well as the center south expansion being taken by some quills, protected by some nice little daggers here. Although the bolus, now we're seeing the bolus being a, a riot unit. So I was saying, I think it was round one, actually, where I was pointing out that I wasn't sure how a bolus actually operated as a riot unit. Against daggers, it makes a lot more sense. Because daggers are entirely built around speed and hit and run tactics, and bolus basically shuts that down. That being said, they're also built around high alpha damage, and when you have a large enough group of daggers, you just one-shot anything anyway, so... Unfortunately, those bolses were simply not enough to deal with, what was that, just this section, 800 metal worth of daggers. Although, considering bolses are 200 metal each, yeah, four bolses would be equivalent in cost. I'd probably be able to rip apart this entire group, but I don't know. They're not very strong riots. They're, they are not maces. They have their uses. They definitely work reasonably well against daggers, but they are not maces. They do not have the HP to survive dagger alpha with a large group like this. Because daggers scale surprisingly well. For raiders, raiders usually don't scale this well. But because daggers have that line splash, yeah, they are... And not just line splash. Line splash, high alpha, and low fire rate. The low fire rate, counterintuitively, is actually really good in high numbers because it means that they're dealing all their damage like through little gaps in each other when those gaps po pop up as the daggers are moving around. As opposed to most raiders, which have to deal constant damage and thus get in each other's way usually having short range, which, granted, the dagger does, don't get me wrong, the dagger's range isn't that much bigger than most raiders, but it only has to fire once in a short, in like every four seconds, or not four seconds, every two seconds. So it's only firing once if it just gets that one little bit of clear space, not to mention it's not got a whole lot of collision box in the way, but if it's that one little frame of free space, it shoots through and deals this damage. So it can be very damage efficient compared to Glaives or Bandits. Not so much compared to Scorchers. But even compared to Scorchers, yeah, honestly. Like, of all the Raiders, I say Daggers most closely follow Lancers or Square Laws. Most Raiders really more closely follow the Linear Laws due to range and collision constrict er, range and collision restrictions. It just constrains them to the point that they really can't benefit as much to the square of their numbers as, like, skirmishers could, for instance. That being said, throw a lance at them or any other high damage unit and they kind of melt. Lance especially, they very literally melt. Okay, Harvey and Pony of the Bola is kind of an auxiliary unit. I mean, to me, it's, like, judging by the numbers, it feels like an Assault Raider. Like, kind of like if you designed a Reaver to not be a Riot, but do all the other things it does, then you'd end up with a Bola. And that's exactly what you have there. But the problem, of course, is that you don't have a really good Riot other than the Mace, and there are no Maces here. There are bolas, and they're doing a pretty decent job, but again, they're more assault raiders than they are, or heavy raiders, than they are riot units. 
which kind of limits their usefulness, especially considering how much of the map Randy has. So I'm thinking at this point, it does not look like we're going to have a three-way tie for first place. Dying Throne might be able to pull this back, but they are 40 metal per second, or yeah, 40 metal per second behind Randy and having a hard time maintaining position in this fight. And just now rebuilding that northeast. I mean, they only recently got the northeast to begin with, and they lost it as well, so now they have to rebuild it too. Randy is in a much stronger position. And also, for good measure, has decided to go for a nice little gunship factory. Because why not? Get them gunships. So at this point, Randy is basically just carrying... I think they're running away with this game. Daimfreund checking their building, going for mass dagger, some scalpels, a couple bolas. Again, I'm not sure. I think that the idea is they're thinking bolas can operate as a raider, as a riot unit. It's like, I don't think so. Like, not by cost. Like, I really do think they're meant to complement daggers, even though they're twice as expensive, or two and a half times as expensive. Because, like I said, they're. You know, daggers are this one shot every two seconds unit that it's really easy to lose just because, you know, they go in and there aren't enough of them, you're screwed. Bolas, they're much more frequent fire, they slow things down. So they can really help to pull units in and stop them from killing the daggers as quickly. But they're not riders. They're not riots. Still kind of cool, though. It's a neat design. Just kind of got an awkward position in terms of the actual factory. And that is dying for throwing the towel. No GGs. Randy takes it. Winning this tournament. They have gotten first place. Solid first place. No one can challenge it. 6-0. Undefeated in this tournament. But we still have two other places with prizes. Harvey N has generously donated money. Or is generously going to be paying out prize money. That's cool. So we are going to be moving on to... Actually, who's left? Oh, Kshatri Manitou. Okay, oh, Manitou have actually won their match. So the two matches that matter for tie breaks. We shall have Daimfreund... Facing off against Manu 12 for for second. Oh, I missed that. I messed that up. No, no, no. Second place is a tiebreaker. Dimefront and Manu 12 both have 5 1. Oh, no. Dimefront's 4 2. My bad. No, it's right. Okay. Oh, but we have a four way tie for third place. Kshatra, Dabakap, Dimefront, and Izzeride all at 4 and 2. So third place, oh my goodness, we're going to have to have a full elimination bracket for third place. I don't know, if, I don't know what we're going to do about that, actually. It looks like that's, yeah, it's all done. Mugesh Batra and Amnon, the only match that is currently unreported, which is like, you know, 2, 3, 1, 4, so it's not going to matter for this. So yeah, we have a four-way tie for third place. I don't know what Aquanim's plan is for that, but... Whatever it is, shall find out shortly. Let's see if we can see anything in the lobby about this. Okay, so. Yeah, so we have a four way tie break for third. Anyway, we'll wait for that. So, advantage. I think what's going to happen is we're going to have a single limb bracket for third place. Which is a weird thing. Grand Thirdles! It's not finals. Okay, so yeah. Four-person single limb best of one bracket for third place. So we'll just wait on that as we get going. So I imagine there'll be two simultaneous matches and then one at the end. I don't know. Is there a third place for us? Her oh, wait. No. Oh,
Yeah, actually, Randy is asking in the chat if there's no third place prize, does it matter? It doesn't matter too much if there, if there is actually a bracket for third place. And it's like fair enough, but yeah, I don't know. Oh, Harvey's only giving prizes for first and second. So yeah, there's no prize for third place. So I'm not sure, other than I guess bragging rights, what the point would be. I don't know. I mean, it's a thing, I guess. I'm... I mean, it's two more matches, basically. That's what it comes down to. Alright, so it looks like we have... Tiebreaker match is already up. We have Dabakev and Daimfreund. And then we have Kshatri and Izzeride. Both of which are going to be played on Vantage. I think we're going to watch Kshatri and Izzeride. Anyway, so let's... We'll get back to that in a sec. 